There's nothing better than bringing my people's joy. Our joy is bold, vivacious, and contagious. Joy gives life flavor with the ultimate blend of rhythm and vibes. When joy takes flight, it can't be contained. It is robust. More than a smile or a laugh, it's an infectious experience. Here's to all the creators that inspire us with their creativity and passion. Keep filling the world with joy. My joy, celebrated by Frito Lay. Welcome back, all the smoke. We here, man. Back in LA, it's been a minute. West side, the best side. You already know. Uh, today we got an iconic voice of radio. Legend. Um, legend in the space. Uh, when he talks, you listen. Uh, the journey is 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 kind of out of a storybook from being homeless to a bodyguard to a radio superstar. Uh, Big, when you sit back and look at your journey, obviously I feel like when we're in the midst of our journey, we, mm -hmm. we never really take time and appreciate, you know, all we've accomplished. But do you ever kind of sit back like, damn. All the time. All the time, bro. Like, you know, everybody come from it. People say it like it's just a cliche phrase, but you, everybody come from humble beginnings, at least the people that we've messed mm -hmm. with. You know what I'm saying? So there's times literally when I'm on the air and I'll stop. And I even tell the people that's listening, like, man, I'm tripping. I'm tripping that I'm in here. You know what I'm saying? I'm tripping that people are listening. I'm tripping that people got their phones. You know what I'm tripping? I'm tripping off this motorcycle that I hear outside. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, man, like, I pray to God I never get used to it. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Right. And there's times when I'll just, you know, my mom growing up seven kids, we have bouts of homelessness. There's times I'm I'm in my house and I'm like, dude, this is this is your house. You know? And then you get up and you you move on. But I trip off of it all the time, mm, bro. That's dope. I'm gonna put you right on the spot off the rip. Mm -hmm. Give me your top three favorite interviews you've ever ever hosted. Mm -hmm. I don't have them. Really? No, nah, man. You know, I, I get that. it all the time. I get What's your favorite or top three probably would be easier. If it's not top three, it's people. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. Snoop is one of those. And y'all know mm -hmm. dog don't have to be talking about nothing as far as it's not an album. It's not a movie. It's not. Right. He could just come in and him. His you enjoy energy. Snoop. You right. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So dog is one of those man. Uh, talking with Barack Obama. Who would have thought, you know what I'm saying? That we have a black president. Then you have a guy that does a hip hop morning show speaking with the president of the United States. I get those where I trip off of, I'm on somebody's itinerary. So whoever it is, you know, I know that the night before they're like, oh man, I gotta get up and I gotta go do big boy in the morning. Mm -hmm. So that trips me out. So every interview that I have, all of them are kind of special to me. I know that's a broad stroke, nah, but I, I interview by choice. You know what I'm saying? And so the people that I choose to interview, I enjoy having them in the neighborhood. That's dope. That GTA recently announced you have a radio station on the game. How has GTA, I mean, it, to me, it's kind of crossed you into a new, a yeah. younger demo. Yeah. Speak to, to, you know, what kind of that, how that partnership works out and, you know, how it continues to expand your uh, viewership. I did, uh, I did GTA 5. And so we had uh, my radio station, I think it was Los Santos in there. I never played the game. They sent it to me and I didn't even know how to start the shit up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't play video games, but I know how to cash checks. You know what yeah, I'm saying? So yeah. they hit me up and they, and I know what it is. Mm -hmm, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I know it's great for my brand, so on and so forth. So just getting with GTA or, and I think it's Rockstar, that mm -hmm. was like, it was a no brainer for me. Right. You know, and then the way that they centered a whole station around you and all the dialogue and there's people that probably didn't even, you know, some people that knew I had a radio show. Anyway, it was like, oh, I listened to your station on GTA. But also there's people that probably didn't even know right. that I existed in this world mm -hmm. until yep. they heard that, yep. you know, and probably some of them still don't know big boys neighborhood. They just know that, that right. station. That's the know? guy off GTA. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> you had the honor of hosting uh, Tupac's star unveiling earlier this year. Uh, in your eyes, why is Pac still so impactful? Maybe, th you know, nearly 30 years yeah, after, man. you know, he's left this earth. You know what? I think, you know, for one, the whole gone too soon, you know, Pac, he left us with a lot of material, left, left us with a catalog. But the one thing with, with Pac as well is that people loved him. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you can love a song, you can love a, a certain time period, but people loved him. Even people that didn't know Pac, I knew Pac before I got into radio. Mm -hmm. So it was crazy for me to know Pac, then for Pac to come in and do an interview and to see how much Pac was loved beforehand. I remember 
one time we were doing a show and I was with the far side and we used to do a lot of shows with Pac. And I remember people tearing down a fence to get to get to Pac. And this is before the Pac that like really blew up. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? This is the I get around Pac. He's still, he's mm -hmm. banging, mm -hmm. but it's not the Pac that right. we know and revere mm -hmm. today. But uh, I just, did I know that we we're gonna lose Pac that young? Not at all. But did I know that we would love him for more years past his death, as far as like he's been loved more years than he was on earth. Crazy. Mm -hmm. And that that love is not going mm -hmm. away. Continues right. to grow. You know, yeah, like my daughter's 15 and she's a Pac fan. No. You know what I'm saying? Which no. which is crazy. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yeah, and doing the star also, bro, that was like when they hit me up to host his star unveiling, that was man. You know, understand. and it's easy to say, oh man, it's big boy LA. I should, but come on, man. Mm, you know crazy. what I'm saying? They that's like they an honor. Anybody. Be oh, Still my God. Yeah. That's an honor beyond honor, right. bro. So right. I literally, I told my wife, I said, whatever day this falls on, I'm there. I will be there. <laughs> and up. I made sure that I was there, man. And it was a beautiful day. People, and, and LA showed up too, mm -hmm. bro. They showed up, mm -hmm. man. You were born in Peoria or yeah. Chicago? Peoria? I was born in Peoria, Peoria, Peoria. Chicago. I played against somebody named Mike Robson. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Purdue basketball from Peoria. Long time ago, um, you moved to Los Angeles with, with, with your mom when you was two. Yeah, how was that transition? Shit, I didn't know. You know, <laughs> at, at two I wasn't in the car like, oh shit, you know, <laughs> mom, stop here. Just picking I up. I mean, going. I don't know too much about Peoria. I mean, it's one of those things now. You know, with navigation, I can get you around. But if you turn to navigation, oh, we all lost. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. So my whole thing was, I was out here in L.A. before I was two. So this is kind of like all I know. Right. I went back to Peoria one time when I was bodyguarding the far side, I think. But other than that, this is this is it. Then, you know, once I kind of got on, my mom lived, you know, in Chicago. Uh, two of my brothers were born in Chicago, you know, but my mom lived there. So a lot of her family's from Chicago as well. And once I kind of got on, then that's when I realized my connection to Illinois mm -hmm. because everybody start calling me shit. Right. You know what I'm right. saying? But I didn't, I Cousin didn't know, you even know you had. Oh yeah. In a major way, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Calling for things that I couldn't give them. I'm like, wait, who this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just call for things. Everybody everybody we wasn't. Up. Hell yeah, <laughs> man, not at all. People think that everybody answers this question the same, but when I hear people answer it, I get different things from them. What does your mom mean to you? Everything, bro. Like my one and only tattoo, it says Ida's son. You know what I'm saying? And I had that before my mom passed. My mom passed in 1999. I always was a mama's boy. You know what I'm saying? I knew that, my man, my love for my mom is not was, it's ridiculous, you know? So my mom worked extremely hard and I could see that as a kid. The sacrifices, seven kids. Now that I'm grown and I have my own kids, like, damn, when did mom sleep? Mm. How did mom, you know, uh, survive off of uh, one paycheck with seven kids? You know, we had a slippery slope with some homelessness, but it wasn't to her failure. It was more still trying to provide for the kids. And when you get in a situation, slippery slope, you know, no drinking, no mm -hmm. drugs, none of that shit was with, with my moms, even with us right now. You know what I'm saying? So my mom was extremely special. And I remember growing up at one point we were living in a motel. And I told my mom, I said, mom, I said, one day I'm gonna buy you a house so we'll never be evicted again. And she told me, she said, I know you will, baby. Mm. Now, nine, 10 years old, there's real shit going on. My mom could have been like, baby, come on, shit. You know, I gotta get the money, like, okay, you know? But when she said that to me, it meant something at that time because it gave me something to keep pushing forward to. And when I told her, oh, you know, I threw everything up against the wall when it came to entertainment. You know, oh, I want to be an actor. She went out and got me acting books. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I'm sitting here in a motel reading acting books. But when I told her I was going to buy her a house and she said, I know you will. That's dope. That was my mission. You know yeah, what I'm saying? So to actually buy my mom a house mm -hmm. and tell her this is yours and no one will ever take it away from you. Man, I could have I could have stopped radio back then. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Glad I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I still didn't have my house. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, right. <laughs> you live with moms, but but yeah, no, my mom meant everything to me, bro. And it's yeah. nothing like losing something mm. that is the most, you know, shit. That, that's yeah. the most precious to me. Mm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when my mom passed, it fucked me up. It messed me up bad. Mm -hmm. But 
I knew it, it seemed like what was crazy stack is like I started getting these opportunities that felt like they were just coming to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I tell Real. people, I say, man, my mom was like my agent and manager sitting mm -hmm. next to God. And it was that thing where she was like, get that girl out of his life. Mm -hmm. Do this for my son here. You know, make this, you know, easier for him. And it felt like things just start falling in, falling into place. You know what I'm saying? And it had to be my mom, mm -hmm. you know? So to this day, bro, my production is Ida Sun production. I take care of my family still because in honor of my mother, yep. you know what I mean? Yeah, that's dope. I said the biggest things I ever done in my life was build my mom and grandmother a house. Yeah, man. There's no better it's feeling, like bro. There's it. no better You know what feeling. I'm saying? It's, it's nothing like it, bro, when you could just say, I got you. Mm -hmm. And of course, selfishly, we all wish we had more time. Right. You know what I'm saying? You wish you had more time, but, you, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So... But what she was able to see and see the billboards and see, you know, the morning show and see her house. And I remember I took her to Vegas one time and she used to love to go to Vegas, but it'd be like them five, $10 turnaround trips on mm -hmm. the bus with a gang of people. I took her to Vegas and I gave her a thousand dollars to gamble. Right. My mom never had a thousand dollars to play with ever, ever, you know? So I left her for like a couple hours when I came back. She had $980. They should have playing a penny machine. Yeah. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> like, you know? But but that that's mom's. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Like I took work. it back from her. No, that's what you work for, man. Yeah. Seeing, you know, seeing people smile as well. Walk with us through through this tough time of being homeless, sleeping on park benches, and just trying to figure out the period, that period in your life, um, how you was feeling and how you was trying to stay positive. You know what, man? Like you know things are bad you know we weren't rich as far as when it came to the dollar but we was affluent when it came to love like my mom we said it i love you i love you i love you so when we were going through our bouts of homelessness it was more of you know the motel eight of us in one motel room you know what i'm saying then we stayed at this place called the sunlight mission and the sunlight mission is just you know you had to go to church mm -hmm. you, you know the boys, me and my brothers, we were in one room. My mom and the girls were in another room. But I think that not having builds a lot of character yes. if you if you know how to accept it. You know, I could sit up, and it's crazy because when we were homeless at a motel, it's as a kid, you'd be like, oh, we got a swimming pool. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Right, right. No swimming pool. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But you found these things that you enjoy. But you do find yourself where you're walking with your friends home, and then you're like, oh, okay, I live this way. And they walk one way and I walk through an alley. And then when I know they're gone, I cut back and go to the, to the motel, mm -hmm. never a hotel, to the motel. Mm -hmm. So you knew those kind of things, man. And it, it like I said, it, it just built this character. And we still had love and, you know, I would perform for the family and try to, you know, be the comic relief and all those kind of things. But but I could see it, especially when I got older, bro. I could see it in my mom's eyes. As a parent, it's crazy when you feel, and I don't know if my mom felt this, but I saw it in her eyes like, damn, did I fail my kids? Mm -hmm. And she didn't. But if you couldn't do something for your babies, you you know, felt that there's way. a certain mm -hmm. feeling mm -hmm. that, yep. that, that you would get. You know what I'm saying? And so I was able to, you know, make sure that once we got older that we were able to take care of some of the things once the boys were able to work my sister started to work you know but but at that time when you're looking at it bro it's like how long does this last right you know is this forever you know and then now as a kid bro all you would want was man i just want an address right you know what i'm saying i want a i want a roof you know and when you start thinking of the basics that you don't have, that you want, when you start to have and get things, you're like, well, shit, I know how to survive with nothing. Right. So I can enjoy this something, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm glad that she had a chance to to kind of enjoy that. But, you know, I think in the rearview mirror, it, it messes you up a little bit more. You're scarred. Yeah, yeah. And, and and it does, you know, and there's a lot of tuition into the school of experience of, you know, how you live your life and the things you want to mm -hmm. do and, you know, living the right way as far as like, you know, 
like I'm still, no matter how many years, I've been 30 years in radio in 2024, right? No matter how much radio I have behind me, I'm still motivated by fear. Hmm. I'm still motivated by, damn, this could hmm. disappear. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, or yeah. it's crazy because well, even when things are going right, you'll say, okay, shit, what's going Something, something about to happen. Right? Yeah, something you know what I'm saying? Happen, oh my God, what's going to go wrong? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's a pattern from when, you know, with growing up Child as well. Trauma. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, expecting mm-hmm. the worst sometimes, mm-hmm. you know? I, th- I think that's a good thing too because regardless of how much success you've had, how much success we had, we always feel like even though it's up, like, not necessarily something bad gonna happen. Still more to prove. There's still more to prove. You oh, still yeah. you appreciate where you at. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you, and you still want to show people that you appreciate that you got more to give. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think having that having that attitude is not a bad thing. You and know what sometimes I'm saying? too, I just stop. And not that you pat yourself on the back, but I stop sometime and I'm like, oh shit, like I got a star on Hollywood Walk of Fame. Mm. You know, like things like that where <laughs> you're like, and sometimes I forget somebody just asked me like, man, when was the last time you been to your star? I'm like, damn, I got a star. Mm-hmm. You know, right. and not that it don't mean shit. I, I don't piss on plaques and all that right. kind of stuff. Right. But no, nah, man, it's like you're constantly moving forward, but sometimes you gotta and just, you know, look around and say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And then Get back up. Yep. As a man, we be stuck in real time. Yeah. yeah, yeah we man. be stuck in real time. Yeah, and everybody else enjoy it around you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm For saying? real. You was around in the peak of the gang culture and the B's oh, yeah. and C's, and you even got in them streets a little bit. Yeah. Dabbled, huh? Had to hustle a little bit. Um, yeah. What was that like? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I don't know. Because when I got into radio, aside from bodyguarding, radio was the first job I ever had in my life. You know what I'm saying? I never had to pay taxes. I never had a W-2. I never really filled out an application and got a job. You know, I just, um, I made way. You know, I made way. And it was, you know, it was a lot of gray stuff that that, that, that I was into, you know, and when we were standing in, in, in the mission, I remember I was like 10 years old and I went up for prayer. And when I was coming back, I'm walking up the aisle and it seemed like this lady just grew in front of me. I didn't see her walking up to me or anything. She just popped up and she looked at me and she said, don't let the devil get a hold of you. And as quick as she popped in front of me, she was gone. So any time in my life when I would mess up, I'd be like, come on, man, Kurt, don't let the devil get a hold of you. Don't let... But, you know, I had one foot in and one foot out. I knew I always wanted this entertainment thing, so on and so forth. But realistically, I was doing other things as well. You know, we I come from, you know, a time when certain things was introduced to the streets of Los Angeles. And it was this, it was this dude named Mixmaster Spade, not his fault. But he had this song where he said, you spend $300, you make 700 back. And mm-hmm. I was like, you spend $300. Make 700 back. You make 700 back. Mm-hmm. Straight to that. Straight to it, bro. <laughs> like straight to it, you know? And it's crazy because if you look at my bio and you pull up anything, my bio says former bodyguard for the far side. You know, like I never try to get into when, when, any hustles that people had, you you got away you you got away from your hustle. You 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 know you separated yourself from your hustle. Oh, I DJ, I this, I that. You mm-hmm. know, you know. Nowadays it's a little bit more goofy where everybody's talking about what they do. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. They want people to know. But yeah, when we were growing up, you didn't talk about that shit. You know what I'm saying. You did that shit how you did it, and and you moved on. But I would play. You know, I had to DJ in business. You know, those kind of things, like literally pack my records up and stuff, you know, just so I could justify having some kind of money. But no, nah, it was like, you know, shit, it, it was it was great. It you was, was doing it, you was doing it for the right reasons. These days they doing it to be seen. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah, and then with me, bro, I was like, you know, three, four, and five hundred pounds. My ID was too positive. So I couldn't, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I couldn't, you know, I was never no strong arm. I didn't hold people up, none of that kind of shit. You know, I did credit cards, I did phones, I did other things, but but yeah, like my ID, bro, like shit. I did something to you, you'd be like, who was you? Like, oh, he's like six feet, like 500 pounds. You're like, oh, is this him? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I, I had to hustle in, in different ways, you know? Yeah. But, but, uh, <laughs> but shit, once I, once, and, and it's crazy because when I say you try to, you know, you try to hold on to certain things, it was like, 
I just felt, man, like everybody around me started getting caught up. Mm -hmm. You know, people mm -hmm. started, you know, either dying or catching, you know, L's. Like at one point I had my partners that was coming home that were doing a, their 25. Ooh, yeah. And everybody was like, <laughs> you know, Carter, uh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. but, you know, everybody coming yeah. home. Yeah. And you yeah. always had them decisions, man. It just felt like I was navigating always around the bullshit. I just missed it. Mm -hmm. I just missed it. You know, mm -hmm. it was like I was on some Matrix shit. Like, yeah. And, yeah. and just missing it, Ain't bro. Ain't no happy ever after in that game. Yeah, yeah, man. So not at all, bro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you was protected mm -hmm. and covered, man. Mm -hmm. Can you say... Um... Mm -mm. I ain't saying nothing. No, go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say Ice-T and NWA made you fall in love with hip-hop? Or who, who, who was the artist to make you fall in love with hip-hop? Ice-T, definitely. Definitely. Because Ice-T, early on, man, he had it was this uh, documentary called Breaking and Entering. And that was the first time I saw, like, I knew of Ice-T, you know, and Ice-T was years before NWA as well. Mm -hmm. But I was on like, you know, Super Rhymes and I, I went out and I just found hip hop, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like I was always on this quest to go get hip hop. You know, of course, my first introduction was uh, Rapper's Delight. Mm -hmm. That was like the biggest introduction because before I didn't know what it was when my partner would have something from New York. I had a par partner by the name of Frankie. And once I got Rapper's Delight, that put me on like this quest where me and my homeboy Trevor would walk to Boys Club and we would just rap Rapper's Delight. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, she heard stories and she heard fables that I'm vicious on the mic and the turntable. I would mm -hmm. rap that. I didn't know what turntables <laughs> were. We had big ass stereos with the arm that dropped the record down and all that. But I just fell in love with it. Yeah. And then once I got to about 13 years old, man. It was just my first set of turntables, which was pieces of garbage. You know what I'm saying? But I would go out and I would just, you know, now you would go, well, not now, but you would go to record stores years ago and it'd be these big, you know, sections. Hip hop, of course, you know, was just in a, you know, it was in a bin if you had that. I would go and just try to get everything hip hop. Mm -hmm. You know, I would try to find, you know, cassettes and, you know, 12 inches and, and, my boy would send me stuff from, from the East Coast, but I was always on this quest because I grew up with music in our household. And that music was shit with the Commodores, Diana Ross, whatever, the Jacksons, whatever was in the household. And I loved music. My brother Keith always kept me in with music. But once I got hip hop, that wasn't my mom's. Mm -hmm. That wasn't my older brother's. Like hip hop was like mine, you know, and it was fresh and it was brand new. And you know, you looked a certain way, you know, like hip hop now with to no fault. It's like, I don't know who hip hop is. It's right. like what it looked like. Right. But you will see somebody if they was wearing like, you know, years fa fast forward, a Kango, some gazelles, whatever it is, Adidas with no shoes. You knew that. Like, oh, OK, they in it. The same it was the same with, with banging back in the days. You know, you could tell who was banging by the way they looked. You know, not by just what they said. I mean, you could spot somebody from a mile away and be like, oh, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like such and such. You know, you go to concerts. I remember going to concerts. You never saw the headliner because they was in there tearing everything up. You know what I'm saying? So there was certain looks. And I think that was the look that hip hop gave, too. And it was good to just see your peers. You see somebody and you're like, oh, and you start talking about this record. And do you have this? And it was, it was just one of those things, man, I immediately fell in love with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the what, what was the West Coast movement like back then? The West Coast movement, it depends on when, when we're talking. The West Coast mu movement was the East Coast movement. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like whatever we was kind of Run DMC was heavy for us. Mm -hmm. You know, I love M Melly Mel. Melly Mel is like one of my favorite MCs. You know, Grandmaster Flash, Furious Five, Melly Mel with. Uh, Soul Sonic Force with Bambada when they did, you know, Happy Planet Rock, Bambada. things yeah, like that. Yeah. Like that was just kind of what was with us. And then when we start with, you know, King T, Toddy T, Mix Master Spade, the original 1580K Day, when you start hearing like those kind of things, like homegrown with mm -hmm. King T and homegrown with, with, with what I, you know, Ice T. Ice T was ours. You know what I'm saying? When you started to hear that, you know, and fast forward to when we get to the 
the NWAs and the Ice Cubes, but when you had, you know, Rudy D, a Snake Puppy, you know, you know what I'm Rudy saying? D. Rudy Pardee, Snake Puppy, LA Dream Team, those are like anthems to us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So we were able to kind of like grab our own. And when we grabbed our own and you go to Skateland, World on Wheels, any of those <laughs> spots, you, you'll see people that, that came from the turf, mm -hmm. you know? You don't know about LA Dream Team, J Mac. <clears throat> J Mac, yeah. Mm hmm. <laughs> at six in the morning, I was at one, bro. Six in the morning was like. That's one of the ones. He told, Ice T told a story. My man started with running out the house from being chased by the police, you know, till he got out of prison. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> my man said, my hair grew long on my seven year stay when I got it done on my shoulders at lay. My man, <laughs> in three and a half minutes, he took you from jumping out the window to coming home from prison. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That, yeah. that I, Ice T's a storyteller, bro. Yeah, one of the best. Mm, yeah, the to best say. to ever do it, bro. How do you go from bodyguard to far, uh, a far side to one of the biggest DJs? She keeps on fast yeah, in, man. Uh, in, in, in the world. You know, man, far side was uh, one of my partners by the name of Paul Stewart, DJP. I'm, I'm not sure if you know him, but DJP, he, he signed to far side. But he was, you know, he repped Farside, Coolio, House of Pain, Cypress Hill. You know, he had Power Move Promotions where he also serviced the records. So um, a situation happened with the Farside in in uh, New York or New Jersey where they had a little problem, you know. And I was always level-headed, but Paul knew me from before. You know, I still, you know, I'm not offensive, but my defense is. <laughs> fucking immaculate you know what I'm saying <laughs> and so he knew me I took you know I took martial arts I was good with my hands so on and so forth and I had level head and I was I was I had all the enoughs I was business enough I was street enough I was hood enough I was corporate enough you know so he was like man I would love for you to come out and just look after the guys all right cool so I go out me and my homeboy seal and uh we had a great you know great run with passing me by your mama like lab mm -hmm. cabin you know, California, where I left while Lab Cam was going on, but that bizarre ride to the far side, it took me all over the world. I never had a passport. I didn't, you know, to me, I, going out of town was like, I would literally tell the homies like, man, I'm, I'm going out of town, man. You know, we're going down to San Diego. You know, that was going out of town to us. I had never been anywhere. Traveling with them, bro, and seeing the world, that was like, it just opened me up because anything that I was gonna do was gonna be connected with entertainment somehow. I was gonna be there somehow, you know. Bodyguarding, yeah, I'll go do that. I enjoyed being on the road. I enjoyed being on the bus. And I used to do a hip hop line called What Up. It was W U D D hyphen U P, What Up. And what What Up, you'll call a regular 213 number and it would just tell you what was going on. Oh, it's Tuesday, Tuesday night, go to Guadalinda's Ecos Club, so on and so forth. But the way I would do it was I just had a turntable and a speaker, an amp. And I would do it on my phone. So if I messed up, I wasn't going to do the whole thing over. I just, yes, nephew, yes, nephew, and this, and then I come right back. <laughs> you know, so you heard personality on right, there, you know? Right. Yeah. And the Baker Boys were doing the morning show and doing Friday Night Flavors and everything at Power 106. And the Bakers had, you know, they had the key to everything. And so their boss would listen to me on that, what up? I'm not knowing who's listening. So one day, literally, bro, I get a call at my house and they were like, I have a, you know, it's Rick Cummings from Power 106. I'm like, oh, okay, hey, what's up, Rick? So on and so forth. But I had went to his house for a barbecue, not knowing that he's checking my vibe. We just had, you know, I'm big boy. The Baker Boys was known as the two fat Mexicans. We were stopping at everybody's barbecue because we were fat asses. <laughs> so they were like, dude, we got to stop at our boss's house. And I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to stop at your boss's house. They're like, oh, it's real quick. I said, man, I'm just joking. I said, man, it's going to be some white man with his white wife, two white kids, white picket fence, and a white house. We get there. The white boss is out there. <laughs> white wife, <laughs> two white kids. And literally, they had a white garden picket fence Ugh. with a white house I'd have to step over. It's everything I said it was. Eat a burger, we bounce. He calls me up at the house, offered me, you know, said, would I like to try radio for one night? I was on a Lollapalooza tour with the far side at the time. So I was like, yeah, you know, he said, I'll give you $35 an hour. I'm in my head. I'm like, oh, okay, shit, I'll go make this money. Call me the next day, ask me if I want to try it again. I'm thinking, okay, shit, I'll do it times two. 
get right back out on the road. After the second show, my man called me and said, you know, I want to try something crazy. He said, you ever thought about doing radio? And I was like, I would do everything. I was like, nah. And he said, uh, I would like for you to try radio. And that's how it happened. Mm. Literally. Crazy. That's how it happened, bro. Stopping by the white picket fence for a burger. Yeah, huh? man. <laughs> and yeah, I went in there, bro, and you know, I, I DJ'd and I did everything. I loved music, but I never did radio in my life. And I remember he told me, he said, go in there, say your name, just remember the station is called Power 106. And he gave me just he gave me a big yard to play in, bro. Mm -hmm. And I played in that yard like a mother. I was, you know. Mm -hmm. They they let the right one and the wrong one in at the same time, <laughs> same time. and it, and it worked. You know what I'm saying? Still, yeah, it's still. Radio personalities back in the '90s, you know, huge influence, almost gatekeepers to to the music space. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like? I mean, any stories you feel like you could tell with labels or artists, bribes, threats? Like, what was that vibe like when radio was it? Yeah, yeah, radio was everything, man. And people felt like, like, um, if you played it, their lives changed. And it didn't, you know what I'm saying? Like, so I was always good on telling somebody no. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got you got to you got to exercise that early because people are passionate, man. And you mess with somebody's passion, that's no longer business, bro. That's personal, right? You know. And to this day, somebody be like, "Big, I, I need to get an interview." We we'll make it happen, but I'm not gonna lie to you and say, "Oh man, I'm gonna bring you in. I could play your record." And the one thing with me, man, is. I never got caught up in the olas, you know, the payola, the plug ola, mm -hmm. and I just didn't owe nobody nothing. You know, I, I had one, um, I had one person that uh, tried to give me a Mercedes Benz, and I was like, "Nah, man." And he was like, "I said nah," because I complimented on him, <laughs> complimented him on the Benz, and he was like, "Man," he was like, "Oh man, just go on and take it, just go on and take it." I'm like, "Nah, man." I was like, nah, I said, and I know what he's doing. You know, shit, I come from that world. You know, you, you, you cut somebody off a big ass piece and then, and then that shit start getting smaller and smaller. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Like, exactly. I know how to hook you. Nah, I'm straight. And then he said, well, give me a dollar for it. And I'm like, nah, because I'd never be able to pay that dollar off. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So other than that, you know, I was, I was always good with just, no, you know, another time, easy E, um, had somebody bring something to the door for me. I never told that story. And, you know, I don't know what money is. They're like, oh, you know, Easy e got a record, so on and so forth. So I go out there and I look, and they're like, give me a bag. And it's like a, it's like one of the movies where somebody hand you a bag with a with cash in it and a CD. And I used to do this thing called Rap Attack. And when I looked in the bag, I didn't know bread back then, but now that I, I know what it looked like, it's probably like 30 racks in there. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Let me came get to that. the front porch? Yeah. Or came the radio station? It came, it came to the radio station. Okay. If it came to the front porch, that would have really been. Yeah, that's what I was saying. That they, yeah, yeah, they pulled up to the crib. Oh, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't have got off my porch. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I was just like, man, I took the CD, gave the money back, and then the record ended up popping by itself anyway. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It ended up popping anyway. So I didn't need to mess up character. And you know, that's a jacket you can never take off, bro. Nah, uh, you can't get that You know back. what I'm saying? Like, I could have did something 25 years ago, like, yeah, man, we paid big for that, so not at all. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? There's enough lies out there, don't give them a truth. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, growing up in LA, any uh, great Showtime Lakers stories? You ever attend any uh, the Forum Club uh, festivities? Hell no, nah, man. I really start going to games I met you. <laughs> 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 No, nah, man. You know, when, when the Lakers were winning, it was good for the city, though. Mm -hmm. You know, we was going back to back and, you know, the three-peat. It was easy radio. But, yeah, I, I never, I you know, I just, I wasn't that guy that was in on a lot of the stuff. You know okay. what I'm saying? But uh, I love what the city felt like when, when those Different things energy. went down. Hell, yeah. And it made it easy. You just had to come on and just be like, oh, yeah, you know, Lakers, game four. Oh, you know. And then the city felt different. Yeah. You know, the parades felt different. Shaq would call in and he had the inside line. He just called in when he won. <laughs> Talking about he had a bird in the car and started barking, you know, like hawking like a bird, all kind of, you know, Kobe would walk in. It was just, it was different, bro. It was different times, man, you know? And it got to a point where, you know, shit, it felt like he had to not even take the engine off the bus. That bus was not going nowhere for a mm, while, bro. Yeah. Like no parades was going down, so, mm. but now, it's cool, but back then it was like, oh yeah, the city felt good. 
but no crazy, no crazy stories, man. Mm -hmm. You know, probably kept me safe. I was too. about to say, that's why you played it today. <laughs> Hell yeah. You know what I'm saying? Talk about uh, establishing, you touched on it earlier. You, had, you, you had got a chance to meet Tupac before he became the Tupac yeah. that the world knew and loved. Uh, what was that like and, and, and how'd you guys develop that friendship? You know what, man? Pac was just, um, just, you know, people say, oh man, he was a real dude. You know what I'm saying? Oh, he was real. He was. My best conversations with Pac were away from everything. You know what I'm saying? Either just sitting in a lobby, sitting in a hotel room. My partner, Smokey, him, his mom and Pac's mom, Afani, was in the uh, the Panthers together. So just catching him at the apartment and just, just talking, you know? And I could see what was going down with Pac when he when he really got on you know what i'm saying that's why you wish we all had certain times where if our moment in time stopped right then mm -hmm. no telling what we could have saw Pac become mm -hmm. you know right. what i'm saying mm -hmm. like like there's a difference between someone when they're 25 and when they're 35 and 45 and 50 Imagine 45, you know 50. to pass without possibly not even having a gray hair you know what i'm saying that's just crazy but i i just had moments where we had cool moments and there was another time, man, where he gave my guys some horrible advice. And I remember when he left the room, I was like, man, don't listen to that shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Cause they passing me by, they felt like when, you know, Pac was like, man, that record ain't platinum. That shit ain't platinum. They're like, man, y'all need to go into that delicious vinyl, just start whooping everybody's ass. And I let Pac say everything. Then when he left, I was like, man, don't do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's like, no, no, don't do that. But uh, just a special being, man. And, and, and what's crazy, is you know how when you know somebody special at the moment, not when they pass. When they pass, you feel it even more so. But I knew that Pac was special at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then when I would see what was going on when, right before he passed, just a lot of the things that was kind of going on, you did want him to kind of slow down, you know, mm -hmm. slow down, enjoy life, you know, because he took everything, he took everything. So passionate. Yeah, man. And... I think that was also a lot of people had a chance to learn. And that's what he did with, with Pac. You always got a lesson, you know, and that's life. He was out, he was contradicting. He did, Brenda had a baby. That's us in life. Some days you want to just chill. Mm -hmm. Other moments you want to, you know, you him. and, and that's, that, that, that was Pac. I feel like he had a song for every emotion. Hell yeah, he did. Nineties. Uh, again, the power of radio. Um, when a lot of the, 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 the killings were going down, like how do you, Manage through that. How do you talk? You were always, again, you were a voice of of relaxation, a voice of realness, a voice of hope. Mm -hmm. When you're going through a time like that, you know, how do you fine tune that? And you talking about industry wise or street wise? A like, little bit of both. Man, for one, you you got to be that voice of of calm too. You know what I'm saying? And not calm to where you say, "Oh, y'all could just f over us." You know what I'm saying? You got to, like I said, you got to have the enoughs. I had to be West Coast enough too, especially when, you know, we felt like there was some attacking going on when mm -hmm. it came to what the West Coast was doing. You know, and when when Cube and Mac and Doug came with Bow Down, you know, those were times when we felt like we had to protect the coast. You know, we had to protect the coast. And then when it got to you know, we start seeing this East Coast, West Coast beef, cause that wasn't beef when it did, when, when, when Bow Down went down. But when it got to the East Coast, West Coast beef, I literally had artists that would call and be like, man, is it cool to come out there? Mm. You know, and now, you know, we record something, we record our interviews, but back in the days, you know, our interviews was live, live. And I remember having to record some of the interviews because people didn't want people didn't know to know they that they were in town. Were in town. And you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm leaving, can you play it when I leave? You know, but it was just, it was just that crazy. Then, you know, the streets was acting a, a certain way and you just had to be that voice because you could either, you know, throw gasoline right. and a match on the city mm -hmm. or you could tell the city like, you know, and I never been that guy where I just wanted to rile you up and just get you crazy. You know, we're not gonna be on no, no goofy stuff either, but, just to get you mad, like, come on, stop it. What role did you think you play uh, uh, in the, in the hip hop in the '90s? Like, how big of a role? And did it the biggest? One, right. No, I'm just <laughs> nah, I, I mean, I I was expecting that. And do you did a lot of artists play you their music? Yeah. To get approval. Yeah, yeah, man. You know, and it, and you got to think, bro. Like, everything was so new. Mm -hmm. At you know, 
I was there with Death Row, you know, I was there with Bad Boy. I'm there with Rough Riders, you know, and any and everything, cash money, mm -hmm. you know, uh, no limit. Like, I'm there through all this and everything that's in between, you know. So you did have people that, man, let me, can you listen to this? What's the next direction, you know? And people really, like, radio is is still a thing now. It's the most listened to still, the, one of the most, the most listened to media, period. It's free radio. Mm -hmm. But you had everybody. You know what I'm saying? Jay-Z had a new album. You had Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. You know, now somebody could drop a new album. You probably may not see them. You know, except if I have a relationship, they're not doing a radio tour. Mm -hmm. I just got a call to be like, hey, you know, Cole, can I, you know, a doc call, call Cole or something. But everybody stopped in, you know, and everybody was like, you know, yeah, you had Big, you know, you had Pac, you had Cube, you had Snoop, you had Eve, you had whoever it was that was dropping something, you had them. The mm -hmm. biggest radio shows, you know, and now with, with streaming and satellite and you can consume music in different ways, that's why you got to have the personality too. You know, you can hear, you know, Kendrick anywhere, but it's what's between Kendrick now. Right. Is what people listen for as well, but yeah, that that '90s era, bro. Like, sh and then think the thing about it too is, I was always a fan of the music, so if I could go to a show, I really wanted to be at that show. Mm -hmm. You know, if I sat down with you, it's because I really wanted to talk to you. You know what I'm saying? And when you fast forward and you look at people now, you see the growth. It is crazy how you'll see. I, I get younger people into the studio, into the neighborhood, and I'm so excited for them because I've seen it before. Right. I've seen it before. You know, like, Corey LeRae, I've seen it before. Tyler, I've seen it before. You know what I'm saying? Even when Kendrick would come for the first few times and him talking about when he sold out the Roxy. You know, now Kendrick, you know, you put him in front of hundreds of thousands of people, and that's his home. So watching people early on and get a chance to be with them and watch their journey, that that's been amazing as well. Being such a big pillar in the music, uh, on the music scene, how did you stay out of any uh, the death row drama, all the death row stuff? It wasn't my business. Yeah, <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Like they didn't come up there. We need this record played. We know no, it's some bullshit, know, but we need it played. What's crazy is that Suge never did that. Where people say, "Oh, Suge Knight." Yeah. You know, it was never like, man, you need to play my motherfucking records. You know, mm -hmm. they had bangers anyway. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. They had bangers anyway. So, nah, I never had no no crazy situation where somebody was talking about you need to play this. And the respect plus, was, I was there. Up front with you too. Mm -hmm. And then. I'm not, you know, I, I... They knew you wasn't going. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you know so why don't you like, try it? And yeah. especially then, yeah. you know? Yeah. And the one thing with me as well, man, I got kids, I got a wife, you know, I've always had a reason to make it home, even mm -hmm. if it was just for me. Right. You know, and it's easier to be square business with somebody, right. you know, because I was in a position, bro, where I never want you to think I owe you anything. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's better for me to not take nothing from you. Right. So I never had, you know, somebody, you know, of course people want you to play their records off, oh, man, you're not doing enough West Coast interviews or you're not, you know, through my career, but it's never been nothing where somebody said, oh, I will meet you downstairs. Like, mm -hmm. that's, that's never happened. Yeah. Right? You know what I'm saying? And then plus, man, like <laughs> the city really look out for me. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like I get people, if I jump out the car on whatever, shit. Vermont, whatever. Mm -hmm. Big, what you doing over here? But I know I'm not naive, but I know the city got me too. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, and, but it's a different time too now. Yeah, you know, they, they're coming ask you for a picture and rob your ass now. <laughs> you know? I love yeah. you, big. Take your shit off. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. It's different rules now, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? These BGs worry me more than the OGs, man. <laughs> Yeah, the way. Like, wow. yeah, man. Like, it's a different it's a different world now. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about how was how LA was when Dre was departing the um Death Row and starting Aftermath. Man, you know what? The same way when you saw Cube leave NWA, you was like, oh man. 
Boy, shit, yeah, she was about to be bad. Like, what's going on here? You know, yeah. because you connected them with so much, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember when, when Dre was done with Death Row, I remember specifically like, man, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean? You know, when he, when he's not with Death Row and the music that we get that we got from them collectively, what does that mean for Dre? You know, what does that mean for for Death Row with the you know, the chronic albums and it was like, man, like how do you leave that? But you kinda uh trust the process and let somebody else go through what they're going through. I'm on the outside, you know, looking in and I'm hearing certain things when it comes to, to the music, but you wonder real talk like man what is that going to sound like does does he have snoop somewhere else yeah. yeah does he have does he have daz corrupt does he have rage you know danny boy whoever the, whoever is there nate does he have that and that dude he's the formula you know the doctor yeah you don't have none of that without the doc no. So yeah, I, I mean, I feel like if uh, Drake could have went anywhere and landed yeah, and built the same thing, and we've seen that many a time, yeah. many times over. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We saw, you know, the introduction of this dude Snoop Dogg. You know, we saw that. We saw the chemistry of putting all these dudes and females in the, in a house and coming with, you know, the Chronic album and coming back with, you know, Snoop's What's My Name and Doggy Style album. It was like, you know, from when we first heard. Deep cover. I I knew something was special. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I knew something was special. And when you see what Dr. Dre, what he did with Michelle, like damn, that's a sound. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? What he did with his projects, that's a sound. Mm -hmm. And then you get the most anticipated, you know, debut album coming from Snoop. That's a sound. DOC. That's a sound, bro. <laughs> And then you, while you're looking over here, here comes this Marshall Mathers. And you're like, where that come from? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so you see that with Eminem. You see that with 50. You see it with Kendrick. You see it with Mary. Like, that dude just get in there, man. And he's a evil, he's a genius. Mm -hmm. Not even he, he's just a, a scientist, bro. Yep. You know? What artist would you say uh, from the West Coast is the, has given the biggest contribution to hip hop? Mm, the biggest that's hard right. because so many yeah man like there's King T from Compton yeah you know what I'm saying there's Toddy T Mix Master Spade all the people that kind of carried us on their backs you know what I'm saying that was doing the skate lands and the world on wheels and you know small spots and just 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 making it not thinking that this was going to be a billion dollar industry, mm -hmm. you know, um, Def Jeff, uh, Ice T, Cube, all of NWA, mm -hmm. you know, everybody was special. All of that death row catalog, you know, and then there there was just cats that you know, DJ Quick, you know, Quick Quick, Quick was Quick. a dude, Quick. man, yeah. that. Homie. You know, yeah, Quick was just he was just special with rhodium swap meet tapes. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> so it's hard to say who did the most because everybody put in everybody pitched in way. And we look at the, the Kendricks of the world, you know, like boom, that's bomb. Game. You know, like game is a hella, hella lyricist to me. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that there's so problem. I, I can go on and mm -hmm. on, bro. There's so many people that put on for us, you know, Cypress Hill, Sin, Be Real, Mugs, 783, like, come on, man. It's you know, everybody with habits. It go, it, Kid Frost, like, we we got represented so Kid well Frost. by mm -hmm. so many people. I do this for La Yeah, man, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he was saying that when nobody was saying it. Mm. Like it ain't, it's not for you anyway. Straight up. This is for La Raza, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yes, like, and then when you hear it now, you're like, damn, that was for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just watching that Hip Hop 50 and watching JJ Fad and we, it's it, it just so many beautiful things. You fast forward now to the Musters, the YG, the Tigers, like, mm. we, 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 we put a lot in. The West bro. has always been strong. Yeah. I'm gonna give you a few names, either first thing to come to mind or something, uh, a memorable moment you had with mm -hmm. them, DMX. DMX man, <laughs> I got a few with DMX, but DMX man, he uh, one of my last sit downs with DMX. He stood up and he performed in the in the uh, the studio for me, and when he did slipping, 
it was mm, eerie. Sex song give me chill. And then when I look back at it now, it I just get a different vibe from it. But DMX, I remember one time, bro, we were at a show, and you know he always in the prayer. So we praying backstage, and we're in a circle of prayer. And then when we got on stage, you know, he's praying on stage, praying on stage. And then I remember he looked, he literally looked at his girl and he's like, you right there. Can I curse on you? Mm -hmm. You right there. I want to fuck you. And we like, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, what, what about the prayer back there? And then remember all the he said, he said, no, 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 no. I, I want to pray for you. I want to fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but that's DMX, man. And dude, DMX, man, he... That's you know, but That's yeah, classic. man, I want to pray. For, I want to pray for you. I want to fuck you. <laughs> Rest in peace to X. Yeah, That's man, dope. the legendary the dog. Uh, Snoop. Snoop. Oh man, Snoop. Uh, I got a quite a few with dog, man. But I remember one night, I um, I was having a birthday party, and every year I would have somebody come. And Snoop, around that time, Snoop is heavy into his uh, Snoop Youth Football League. So I would, years, you know, my birthday fell during the season and dog would lock himself in. So he would, you know, respectfully like big, you know. So when I finally got him one year, that's when I said, dog, I said, I really want you to do it this year. Man, I got you. I got you. He told me he'd do it for free. That's a dog. Mm. Just send him transportation. So I, you know, the mini coaches where it's like fixed up on the inside mm -hmm. and everything. I send, I had a mini coach. I didn't send him mine. I sent him another one from, from one of my partner's companies. And they, you know, all oh, Snoop is in the car. They're 45 minutes out. He's on his way. He's on his way. All right, cool. Next thing I know, dog is there. Somebody come from, get me there. Like, hey, man, they said, uh, the bus smells like gasoline. And I'm like, what? I go in the bus, man, and it smelled like a gas leak. So much that dog was afraid to smoke. You know it must be bad if dog is not going to smoke. Yeah. So that night, bro, I almost killed Snoop by putting this dude in the in that bus. So literally I sent him home in my bus and I got home with my people. And the bus, that when they were taking his bus back to the yard, it caught on fire. No way. <laughs> so on my YouTube channel, I got a, the whole story of the night I almost killed Snoop Dogg. <laughs> and you know how Snoop do his GGN, GG uh -huh. his interviews? Man, I don't know who did his uh, research. Everything was wrong. <laughs> my man, and you know, dog man. So, cool, man, cause you wrote a book. Tell me about this book, man. What made you write a book? I'm like, dog. I wrote that book ten years ago. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everything, everything was wrong, man. You gotta love dog. Man. Oh shit, that's mm -hmm. good. Uh, Kanye, he's making Kanye. a little run right now in Miami. Dropped the snippet. Hell yeah, his music man. Last night. Kanye, man, I've I've had some of the most interesting nights hmm. with Kanye, especially during the life of Pablo. Kanye would call me one in the morning. I need you to come hear something. You know, Kanye was was like my dog. I don't mess with him as much right now, but Kanye was, you know, creative genius. He was my dog, and I remember one night, man, I was literally at um, Coachella, watch, and I'm watching the weekend, and I'm far back watching the weekend sitting down on this, uh, like this riser. And my phone kept going off and I'm looking I'm like, damn, it's Kanye. And you know, when Kanye, when he needs something, not need something, but when he want to holler, it's something big. So I pick up the phone, big. I'm like, what's up? Where you at? I'm like, man, I'm at Coachella. Man, I need you to, uh, I got a plane. I need you to come to Africa. <laughs> I'm like, man, bro, I'm at Coachella. No, no, I got a plane right there, man. Just go to such and such. I need you to come to Africa right now. I'm like, man, I can't, I gotta go to work. Right. I don't have nothing. We're gonna shop when you get here. Get on a plane and go to <laughs> Africa. Africa. Leave my yeah. family. Leave yeah, the kids. man. You know what I'm saying? How do I call my wife? Like, yeah, baby, take the kids tomorrow. I gotta go to Africa. <laughs> I'll be right back. Yeah, like and, and Africa is not like somebody saying, Hey man, can you come out to Riverside? Right. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like that's somebody tell you go to Riverside from Coachella. You're already like, yeah. oh, okay, man. I could probably make it there for what, 30, 45 minutes from Coachella. I think it's Africa. Yeah, my man said Africa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, man. You got a jet waiting on you. Man, man right? got the jet waiting. <laughs> the best part. Uh Kendrick. Kendrick, man. Kendrick, uh <laughs> I remember I asked Kendrick, I said, Kendrick, I said, man, what's your wackest song? 
And he said, it was a song called Bitch, I'm in the Club. And we found it. <laughs> and when we played it back, and, it's, and it's, it's online, when we played it back for him, dude, he was literally like melting in his seat. Hey, and dude. it was like, Bitch, I'm in the Club. By Kendrick standards, it wasn't what Kendrick, what he is today. But man, his worst was, man, his worst could have been somebody else's best. Yep. Mm, and yep. I was like, man, when you were doing that then, he was like, oh, Vic, you trying to act like you like it. I was like, when you did that song, did you think it was whack back then? Like, you don't press play like, man, you want to hear something horrible? Listen to this. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah, look how your head's not shaking. Yeah. That's what I was That's yeah. what I was aiming for. Yeah. But yeah, just uh, that, that's my Kendrick thing, just watching him melt in his seat, bro. That's funny. 50. 50. Oh, man. Oh, 50. It, years ago, I lost a bet to 50 Cent. And I literally had to, uh, he had some kind of, mirrored looking chrome Lamborghini that I had to wash at the station in front of listeners. <laughs> and it was one of those cars where when you wipe it, it didn't look like it was dry. Mm -hmm. So I had to keep on wiping it, but losing that bet to him. Then when I came back, I remember I got, I got another bet on him and I got him for 10 racks. And that was like my payback. That, that was definitely my payback, man. And another time was going to his house in Connecticut, the one that he bought from uh, Mike Tyson. You ever been in that house? Bro, that, it, that house was ridiculous. You had to be a, a young rapper to buy that or a, bo a young boxer with lions and tigers and bears on mine. <laughs> right. Because it was ridiculous, man. Like you could literally be in that house and he wouldn't know that you were on the other side of that house. Mm -hmm. That it was it was ridiculous, yeah, man. He right said it's, he was spending like seven hundred thousand a year just enough. Okay, up. that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson. Oh man, Michael Jackson. There's there's a few with Michael too, man. Like <laughs> Michael was laughing at things that I thought he shouldn't have been laughing at. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I was really like this. Do you have you met Michael? I never got a chance. Oh, to. okay. I was like, yeah, like, should Michael really be laughing at this? You know, and he caught me in rare form. And we, you know, it's just us. So I'm, you know, I'm big boy and I'm just having fun. But I remember he asked me, he said, can you go to a store and can you go shopping? And I'm like, yeah. He said, so you can, you can go into a store and you can just like shop and, and put things in the cart and, and no one bothers you. I said, they'll bother me, but. You know, I can go shopping. And he thought that that was like so big. And he was like, so do, do you go shopping? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, wow. <laughs> and you put things in the cart in public? And I'm like, yeah. I said, man. And I told him, I said, who the fuck you think I am? Michael Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Right. You know, but yeah, Mike was. And I remember, dude, he told us it was a CES show going on. And he wanted to hang that whole day. And he was like, he told us, he said, yeah. And Will I Am was like, oh, you know, the CES show, electronic show out here in Vegas. And he was like, oh, we should go together. Let's, let's all go. Let's go. We'll go after hours. And, and I was like, this dude know that he can make a call and they'll keep the CES doors open for him because he's Michael Jackson. That, that was the craziest, bro. Mm -hmm. And I remember at one point when I went to grab his arm and I was expecting something like, like frail, now I went and touched his arm, like, oh shit. I'm like Mike was been, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, but oh man, oh man, nah, I can't do that to Mike. Nah. Yeah, you can. Sorry. Yeah, you can. He's smile, he's smiling right now. Go ahead. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> he's smiling right now. So we up there. Oh man. Yeah, I'm gonna get you some more water while you Yeah, talking. man. <laughs> oh, they got this right. So we up and um <laughs> <laughs> so we listening to some music because he brought us up to listen to some music, right? So literally, it's me and Fuzzy and Will I Am. Uh, Fuzz and I are sitting on this couch, and if you guys know my, you know my boy Fuzzy. Fuzzy's a piece of shit, <laughs> right? And so we're sitting, and this is Michael. Jackson, That's definitely your boy. Bro. Yeah, we're sitting on the sofa, on the sofa, and there's a the mixing board right here, the soundboard. And so Mike is sitting at the board, but he's sitting sideways. So our profile is him sideways, but we're looking at him. And I know Fuzzy's thinking the same thing. Like, dude, this is Michael Jackson, bro. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, this is Michael. And so I'm not even looking at Fuzz. I'm looking at Mike, and I know that Fuzz is looking at Mike, right? And so I just happened to do like this because when I listen to music, I have my eyes closed. And so at one point, I look up, and Mike's sitting at sideways at the board, and he's, like, doing the Michael thing, right? And I'm looking at him. Then I see my man go like this. I looked at Fuzz, Fuzz looked this way. I don't know. He adjusted his hair. And I remember, dude, I just looked at Fuzzy like. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the quickest. Did you see that? Like, and, and I don't know what it was, but it, whatever, it, whatever result, it was beautiful. It was in place. But it needed an adjustment. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and we just happened to look up like, and I remember, dude, just looking at Fuzzy like. Uh, and, and Fuzz, tacky Fuzz went. <laughs> right. Yeah, man. Oh shit. Now watch all the Michael Jackson fans get mad at me and nah, shit. That's a good one. Fight me. Um, <laughs> there's obviously a handful of unfortunate moments while mm -hmm. you are on the air. Um speak to us, you know, how, how it hit you and, 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 and what kind of day it was on the radio. First and foremost, Pac when he passed. Pac, man, Pac, we didn't have social media. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have social media. It was one of those things where there was no TMZ, mm -hmm. you know? So when Pac got shot, of course we all knew Pac got shot, you know? And so I started hearing rumblings that Pac passed. So I get to the station and at this time I'm working um like the three to eight shift. I'm, I'm not in the mornings yet. And I'm hearing Pac pass. So, you know, you start making calls. Man, you hear anything about Pac, you hear anything about Pac. So, we get to somebody that's really, that really know. And they're like, yeah, man, you know, Pac passed. Mm. I'm like, damn. So we're in an office and we're all trying to find this lead on Pac and not to be the first one and be the bearer of bad news. But I remember I had to tell LA that we lost Pac. And so it literally felt like, you know, when you a kid or when you graduate and you do that graduation walk where it's one foot here, then it's one mm -hmm. foot there. Mm -hmm. It literally felt like I was doing the graduation walk through quicksand. I didn't want to walk down the hallway. I didn't want to turn on my mic. I didn't want to tell LA because I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to believe it. I love Pac. Mm -hmm. So walking down and turning on my mic and as soon as you start the show, you know, you do your call letters, Power 106, you know, we got some unfortunate news. You know, we just heard that, you know, Tupac Shakur passed. And I remember, dude, the phone lines just Ooh. lit up. And to this day, I'll still get people that say, man, I heard Pac pass from you. Mm. You know, I heard Pac. Not knowing that this dude that I sat on the same bed with leg to leg and had these conversations or whatever, that I would be the one the that would break the news. And then fast forward when I, so when I do a rewind, from his star, that's all the things that I was rewinding when I have had the opportunity and was honored to do his uh, star ceremony. But yeah, that was one of those things that was that was hard speaking to LA. Mm, mm. Biggie. Oh man, Biggie was another one. Biggie, Biggie passed on March 9th, my birthday. Man, and it was if I think that year it was a Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. And because I wasn't on air that day. And I remember the same way, you know, wasn't burnt up on social media by the time we got to work. And that was another one where you felt like, like, damn, like big pass, like this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. This is what, this is what's going on. And then the way that it happened in LA, it was just, it was, it was a, a, just a feeling where you're like, oh man, you know? And I remember the last time I saw big, I was at, um, the palace, but I think it's like the Avalon or something now. And literally somebody was like, oh, you know, do you want to take a picture with Biggie? And I was like, oh man, I'm cool. I said, I, he's going to come to the station. I get it when he come. Never saw mm. that. You know what I'm saying? Never, never came. But that was one of those things where that, that one personally hurt too, you know, because, because big dude, that was, he was a very good dude, man. You know what I'm saying? And that one, that one hurt too. Like it, it was just one of those things, the way that it happened, you know, where it happened at, how it happened. And you think, man, like when, you know, it was fucked up at the time. But when you think about these dudes being, you know, 
Babies. 25 babies. babies, bro. You mm-hmm. know, with, you know, he had a son and a mom. And you know what I'm saying? It was just, it was just a shitty situation, bro. Mm-hmm. Nip. Man. Mm. Nip was a, <clears throat> Nip was, Nip was like, that was, that was another one, bro. Like, Nip was real hard. You had a close relationship with him, yeah, too. Yeah, that was a hard one, man. Like, uh, just, you know, how good brother was, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, just the way he was in the room with everybody. He looked at everybody, and you knew he was special. So, uh, that was hard, you know. That was uh <clears throat> because it's crazy because you know I have a chair in my studio and that chair is like it's my interviewing chair. So if I'm here, the guest is right there. And in that chair, <clears throat> we were talking, Jose and I thanks, Jose. We were talking one day, man. And I was talking about the chair and I was like, dude, I said, that chair, Andre Harrell, Juice World, Nipsey, DMX, anybody else? Mac Miller, like Juice, I said Juice World. Those those are people that sat in that chair that were in studio that's not with us anymore. But with Nip, man, Nip was like, you know, I missed the, what's up, bro? You know what I'm saying? The phone calls <laughs> or him always trying to lay like a book on you. And you know what I'm saying? You thinking hip hop, this dude telling you to go read Socrates or some shit like that. But he just really, he was always good in the room. He looked at everybody. He talked to everybody. And he was wise beyond his years, mm-hmm. man. So wise behind it, beyond his years, man. And And that was just a hard one, bro. And not only was it hard, he died in a social media climate. You know, I didn't see nothing too crazy about Pac. I didn't see nothing too crazy about Big. But I watched a video that I wish I'd never watched Mm -hmm. with Nip. You know what I'm saying? And watching that and knowing, you know, his family and knowing, you know, Sam, it, 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 it just hit hard, bro. That one, that one was a hard one. Hmm. That that one, that one hurt everybody around the globe because you got a lot of people in the hip hop game, but lot ninety eight percent of them aren't leaders. Yeah, Nip man. Nip was a leader. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm bro. saying. He was a leader, and, and, and hip hop is missing that. They don't have a leader no more. What was next? What was coming? You know what I'm saying? What was coming, bro? And you know, and just like with Pac and Big and soldiers that we lost before, like. Hopefully we we just learned something yeah. from that. Mm-hmm. You know, we learned something either with Nip, learned about, you know, being an entrepreneur, learning your, you know, like I remember when Nip did that, uh, what was it, was it Proud to Pay Dave? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And man, I was never so proud to pay $100 for a CD mm-hmm. in my life, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? But he was just outside the box, bro. Mm-hmm. You know, he was outside the box, man, so. Shout out our brother David Gross too. Yeah, man. What up, David Gross? Yeah, man. Big business partner in Nip. Mm-hmm. Um, Kobe. Oh man. Kobe too, bro. Kobe shooting. Y'all, man. You oh, come on, man. Y'all got uh, real ones. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Kobe, like, for one, I had Kobe his whole basketball career. He grew up in front of ours, huh? Yeah, man. So you know, we seeing the wins, the L's, the championships, you know, the wife, the kids, this is just the everything Kobe. And I remember the way that I heard about Kobe passing is what really kind of like, like really like fucked me up, man. I was, uh, it was a Sunday and I remember my wife was driving and uh, no, I was driving. My wife was in the passenger seat. And my daughter was with her friends behind us. And my daughter called and I'm driving and I hear my wife say, Kobe died. And immediately I'm like, and she's like, what? Kobe, Kobe Bryant. And I'm sitting here like, what's going on? And at that time, early on, you know, 
it was other people on the, in the helicopter. This, you know, that remember they put Rick Fox who was and all on kind, there. Yeah. yeah. And so I remember when we got to where we were going, you know, we started, you know, making phone calls and and filling things out. But that hit, it hit, man, it hit the city. It hit you personally. And then, you know, as a dad and, and you know, he and Gigi, the other lives, you know, I remember my, my daughter came to me and she asked me, she said, she said, dad, she said, do you think he had a chance to hug her? Mm. You know, and I was like, I hope so. You know, and your mind go a thousand miles in a second and you know what's what's happening. And I, 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 that's where I go, like, man, what was brother thinking? What was he feeling, you know? And when you just started seeing the memorials and things stopping down and, you know, the phone calls. And I remember doing my, my radio show, the same with Nip. When we turned on our mics, because we had to go live, when we turned on our mics, it was probably two to three minutes of crying before anybody said a word you know it i couldn't i couldn't muster it up i couldn't like oh man you know you've been here before each one of them man i think i'm a sensitive person anyway each one of them just meant something something totally different hmm. you know thank you for sharing that with yeah, us i know that, that was tough for you and matt i remember you know you've been to the living room bro mm -hmm. like i remember going to my house after we left that that little uh, get together I remember going to my house and I could smell, I could smell the uh That's how close the, it was to us. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. on the other side of, of the, the hill. Yep. So I could mm -hmm. smell it in my house, man, like the propane or whatever, the gasoline. Mm -hmm. I was like, damn, I could, you could smell it. Mm -hmm. Like very close. Right there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, something a little lighter. You sure? Yeah, yeah man. We went deep. We dove real. deep. You sure don't want to explain the death of my mom and shit? Like, <laughs> damn. Hey, tell me about the last time you saw your mom. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Years. What? Years. What about it? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm just saying. He'd be like, yeah, hey, big. Hey, talk about. So your brother had a stroke. <laughs> talk, to <me. laughs> talk to me about that. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, phone taps. Mm -hmm. Something legendary uh, that, that that we grew up on. Um, did you have to uh, clear the sample of phone taps from Dre? Yeah, yeah. Dre, Dre, Dre let me get it. He definitely let me get it, man. Yeah, it was just one of those things where we all played jokes on the phone. Mm -hmm. It was just one night, man. I would learn, like, I had to learn how to use the board when I first got into radio. Mm -hmm. And, man, I wasn't even trying to touch that board for, like, my first six months. So we would just get on there and when they told me, hey, you got to learn how to work the board, I started doing overnights to learn how to work the board. So that was like midnight to like 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning when the Baker Boys came on. So I still had my board out there trying to teach me things. So literally, I would call businesses that was open and we had a reel to reel and I just record them. We would play them back laugh and all that kind of shit just for us. Mm -hmm. And I put them in my locker years later I played one for my producer, Jason Ryan. And he was like, oh, we should play this on the air. Played it. People laugh. You got another one? Played it. People laugh. He said, how many do you have? I only had like probably five of them. He said, I think we should start doing this on the air every day. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I didn't have a name for the for the bit. It was just, you know, prank calls. Mm -hmm. And so one day, um, the lady asked me my name. And I was like, oh, you know, my name oh, is Steve Larkis. And she was like, okay, Steve Larkis. And so Steve Larkis was a name for like a couple phone taps. And then um, one time another person asked me my name and I said, Steve Lufay. And <laughs> boom, okay y'all, Steve Lufay. And for some reason, this lady asked me, oh, and your name? I said, Luther Lufay. There it is. And she said, Lufay? She said, how do you spell that? <laughs> and so I said, L-U-F-F-E-I-G-H. The first F is silent. <laughs> And I told Jason, I said, every time I do one of these calls, That's who I am. I'm gonna say Luther Lufe. Mm -hmm. You know, and it and it and it happened on accident. You have the you have one that was most memorable. I know you've done a ton. Yeah, I got a few. I got I got a few, man. It's this thing called uh one of them is called Fala La La Lights. 
and it's the ho- it's the holiday season. And I tell this dude that he won this like extravagant light show on his house, and we're gonna come <laughs> by and put these lights on. And the way that you get them is if I just called you and I was like, hey, we got a light show, and you'd be like, man, fuck you, and you hang up. But when I call and I say, hi, man, I speak to Matt Barnes. Oh, this is Matt. This is Matt at such and such, and I give you your address. You're invested. I got your phone number, I got your address. And then I just play you slow, like, oh yeah, okay, so I'm about 35 minutes out. Wait, 35 minutes out for what? Oh, I'm on my way, we just got sidetracked at another job. What do you mean sidetracked at another job? Oh, we coming to do your lights, you won the Christmas lights from Follow La La Lights. What is Follow La La Lights? So now, <laughs> I'm invest. you're invested because I told you your address, your name, all this shit, right? My man went off. My man told me the last thing he said before he hung up on me. My man said, you could suck the shit out of my ass. <laughs> I'm a motherfucker, man. Fuck that mother. I, like, I never heard nobody say you could suck the shit out of my ass. That's crazy. Yeah, so that one, and it's another one. That's crazy. For this lady, uh, where well, I told her I was bringing a, um, a haunted house to her, uh, I think I remember this one. Yeah, it was, I think yeah. I remember this one. And she was going berserk, <laughs> she was man. Pissed. She was talking about how she live in a high rise, <laughs> and I'm telling her how we are gonna come and bust the windows out of her place and bring these ghouls and goblins and shit, man. That's what. And I remember the last thing she said to me, and I said, "There's gonna be kids for the candy." She was like, "There are, there's gonna be candy for the kids." She said, "There are no kids in this building. It's a fucking high rise." <laughs> Boom. Hang up. But no, I got, I got a volume. That's you know, dope. I got many that I sit up and I'm just like, bro, what is wrong with you? You're a fool. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you know, yeah. But yeah, when they hang up, <laughs> they gone and I'm right, gone. Right. Yeah. yeah. I want to. Uh, when we cut the edit up, I want to get those two. And oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that'll be definitely. Fun. All right, we, we we getting near the finish line. Weight loss journey. What was your peak weight? My peak weight that I saw on the scale was 511 pounds. Now mm. they see I'm on the room. Mm. Like, hmm, were you walking? Like Kevin Hart. Damn! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kevin Hart. Damn. Like, like man, like shit. Damn. Like were you were you on your way to six hundred pound life with Dr. Now? Mm. No, but uh, there was five hundred and eleven pounds. Yeah. And that was on my surgery date. I got surgery about twenty years ago, gastric bypass mm-hmm. uh, surgery. But I must have been bigger than that because the doctor told me lose as much weight as you can. Um from now to your surgery date. And I had about two weeks. And I know in two weeks off of that frame, I know I probably could have lost 40 pounds. Mm. You know, so probably. Mm. But that weight that I saw was 511 pounds. Who was the biggest impact that motivated you to keep going in your weight loss journey? Will Smith? Will Smith started it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Will Smith started it, man, because I had been big like my whole life. And you know... Like, even when my mom passed, right, everything wasn't like a, a light switch. It was like, oh, shit, I need, to, I need to get my shit together. Everything for me was more of a dimmer, you know? And then as the dimmer is going, then the light, the room gets bright. Oh, damn, I understand. But Will Smith, even my Will Smith challenge, man, the weight loss challenge, I had Will Smith on and, you know, off air, Will was talking about, you know, hey, what about your health and, you know, your age and so on and so forth. And I remember he told me, he said, man, well, let's do a weight loss challenge. And I'll give you $1,000 for every pound that you lose. And we'll donate it to charity. I'm thinking, cool. I love this. You know, I check in every week and then I'll come in and we'll just weigh you and so on and so forth. I'm not even thinking about health at this time. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, man, I'm thinking radio, man. I got Will Smith for six months dedicated to me. Yeah, I'll do this weight loss challenge. Get on first week, I lose 26 pounds, right? 26 racks off, off the top, boom. I lose 101 pounds in six months. I could have lost more because I lost 26 the first week. Mm-hmm. But my main thing was Will Smith, Will Smith calling in from the set. How you doing? All right, let's weigh him in. Let's you know, go. I get on. But this is radio. This ain't health. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying, Matt? This is radio. Oh, I, it's Will Smith. Will Smith checking in Thursday, 17, that kind of shit. So then when it comes to the actual end of the weight loss challenge, we got the local media there, the news is there. Will Smith, you you know how they come with the oversized check and he signs it and all this stuff. It's great radio, great television. I'm literally on the scale in my boxers and a t-shirt weighing in. And I'm like, 
man, when I finish with this, I'm going to La Fogata's and give me some chicken nachos. <laughs> that was on my dome. Mm-hmm. Boom. No. All right, y'all. Peace, peace. Boom. <laughs> I'm right back in the game. The challenge is over. Mm-hmm. And I had never felt slow. Like, I still worked out. I did everything. You know, I'd have had to park there in, in the front and waddle in. You know, no disrespect. But yeah, I could say, I don't have to say no disrespect. Shit, I was 500 pounds. Right. You know, who's going to get mad at me? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I remember I was walking through the Burbank airport one time, man. And I had to stop and catch my breath. And I felt the pain in my back. I never felt that before, but I had lost the weight and I was putting the weight back on so rapidly that I just felt like, man, I have to do something. I have to do something. You know, this before my kids and all that stuff. So I did that. I did that for me. And I had a lot of complications. You know what I'm saying? But it that literally for me, that saved my life. The big pun have like did it wake you up or did it have you thinking all that yeah buffy from the the but you like i said it was a dimmer yeah my mom didn't wake me up mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying so yeah you'll see the big puns of the world i remember fat joe and i we were talking when pun passed and i remember he was like yeah you know big we got to take care of ourselves you know we made a commitment but you know now you see joe he's good mm-hmm. you see me i'm good but it took me 10 years to just learn nutrition because you don't get a gastric bypass surgery and then wake up and it's just, mm-hmm. you, you know. Your mind is still you Yeah, still you know, work to do. Yeah, and, and, and even up until a couple of years ago, man, I went to this place called the Hoffman Institute where you do this thing called the process. And that's why I even learned even more about my addiction and my love affair with food. You know, you, you eat when you're happy, eat when you're sad, eat when you celebrate, eat, eat when you depressed, whatever it is. Eat. I was constantly eating, you know, and you had to learn where those triggers came from as well. And I think now, even right now, I'm on a program where, you know, I'm on a, not a, as, as Richard Simmons would say, I think it was Richard Simmons. It's not a diet. It's a live it. Mm. So I just live and I, you know, I don't eat after eight. I don't eat, you know, pastas and breads and potatoes and things of that nature. I just, you know, I work out, you know, but shit. I paid a lot into, you know, I paid a lot of tuition to the school of experience, bro. Right. But I was able to get out and, and possibly, I think I saved my life. Maintaining. Congratulations. Yeah, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. What's your advice to anyone who's um, on a weight loss journey? One day at a time. One moment at a time. One minute at a time. One second at a time. You know, and people don't see, you know, it'll take you, sometimes it'll take you, it's quicker to lose it than it is to gain it. Cause I gained weight my whole life. It didn't take me a lifetime to lose it, you know? And I don't mean like 10 pounds, so on and so forth, but that's the, that's the, that's the biggest thing, man. We, we take care of so many other people, mm-hmm. but we don't take, I didn't take care of myself and not mm-hmm. we and they and you, I didn't take care of myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I would put the highest octane into my, my car, but I wouldn't put the best octane into my body. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I worry more about other people than I worried about me. And the first thing they tell you when you get on the plane, they say, you know, secure your Your mask mask before anybody else. Yeah. Like, so if I'm not taking care of me, how do I take care of my kids? Right. You know, and it's just been for me. I see so many different sides too. you know, I see the, the prejudice, you know what I'm saying? I see, you know, when I was walking down the aisle getting on Southwest Plains, I know people didn't want to sit next to me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I see that now that I'm smaller and I see I see certain things and they don't know, you know, yep. I'm in the club. I used to be that. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the you, club. you know, I'm in the club. But I just tell people that whatever your journey is, man, you know, it's a it's a lifetime journey. Yeah, mm-hmm. It's a journey where- It's like any other addiction, yeah, right? Yeah, and every day is not going <clears> to be- the best day and you know i just try to do a little bit better than i did yesterday hmm. you know question now this could be urban legend and we don't even have to talk about it but the, the, any truth to you got arrested one time and hit a gun in your fold and it went undetected we don't have to talk about it if you don't want to we get blooped it but this motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> hey, no. can, can i can i tell you the story <laughs> please can i would love to let me tell you this story bro so i was bodyguarding the far side right 
And when I was bodyguarding the far side, we had to go to the Bay Area to do some shows like Souls of Mischief, you know? And so uh, OJ is on the fucking 405 that day. Really? So we're Lord, literally- That's a hell of a way to start the day. Lord. Watching OJ and his boy on in the Bronco. The juice is loose. <laughs> yeah, man, in a major way. So we're watching this and um, we're missing planes. The guys don't want to leave. They're they're glued to the TV. Yeah, yeah, the world was. So I'm booking other flights. Okay, we can get them. You know, it's, it's the bay. There's a flight every hour. Okay, well, make sure, make sure, make sure. So now we get to a point where we can't fly. We like, forget it. Let's just rent a van. So one of my guys go get a rent a van. Now I already had a gun on me, right? So I figured, I'm like, man, if we're going to drive up, I'll just take my gun with me. So we drive up. They get with, they do the shows, but now they want to stay with Souls of Mischief to do some recording. So I'm like, all right, man, well, I'm going to get back to the crib because I was still doing other things at the house. So I was like, I'm going to get back to the house. I said, man, when y'all get home, drive my gun back home. I flew back home. I left in the van. So when they get back to L.A., they call me up and they're like, big, you know, we're back, so on and so forth. So now I have my other gun on me while I'm going to go pick up the gun that I had with the far side. So I go, got my gun, go pick up the other gun. I'm driving back. As soon as I get to Culver City, boom, they lit me up. I had two warrants for my arrest <laughs> already on some, just some other small shit, small like traffic shit, right? And so I always told my brother, I said, hey man, if they catch me on these warrants, I'm just gonna do the days. Don't bail me out. Just let me hold on to the cash. All right, cool. That's an understanding. So then I get pulled over. They come up, I'm in a white Astro van that I just bought. Not knowing that when I bought this van, I bought it from this dude from 30s, right? I don't know the van van <laughs> enough. So they, they sit me down, they go through my van. My man comes back to me. I said, where's the gun at? I'm like, I don't have a gun. Where's the gun? I said, I don't have a gun. You know, and that's when we started, you know, officer, boss. So like, I don't have a gun, officer. So my man told me that in my seat that there was a slit because it had these captain chairs with this material. When you pull the material up, dude cut a slit in there, but it was empty. So now where's the gun? Because you had a stash spot. I don't have a gun on me. Literally, I'm wearing a t-shirt, some sweat shorts, and them corduroy house shoes, right? So my man get me, searches me up, doesn't find a gun. Sit down, all right. Starts going through my van, comes back to me, where's the gun? Officer, I don't have a gun. Stands you back up. I'm wearing a t-shirt, sweatpants, and house shoes. Searches me again, sit down. So now I'm sitting there and I hear the dramatic Kurt Alexander worn out of such and such and such and such. Kurt Alexander worn out of such. And I'm like, fuck. So my man come back and said, you got some warrants for your arrest. He said, and I'm going to put a detective hold on your van because you won't tell me where the gun is at. I'm looking at this dude when he tells me, stand back up. Now he searches me again. Now I look at him, go to my van, and I see this dude tugging at my interior because now he got a he got a, a hold on it, tugging at my liners, all this shit. I'm looking at him throwing shit out my van, and I'm sitting on the curb. Now he comes back frustrated. Stand up. I stand up. Now he's behind me, and he's literally going like this to me, like like tap and like pow pow. pow. My man, tow truck come, they take my van, he links me up, takes me to, to uh, it's Culver City. I get in there and just make a phone call. I call my brother Mouse. I'm like, Mouse. I said, hey man, I said, you need to come and get me. They got me on these warrants. Wait, what's going on? You told me don't bail you out. I'm like, Mouse, come get me. <laughs> <laughs> no, Kurt, what's going on? What's going on? I'm like, Mouse, come bail me out. I got you, come bail me out. He's still trying to get me to talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. So now this is probably like two, three in the morning. The county bus comes about five, six in the morning to pick you up and take you to L.A. County. So if man, he must have got there in like record time because it's like a movie. I hear him say like, Alexander, you know, it's almost like a movie. You made bail. And as I'm walking out, there's a door with a window and I'm looking at my brother 
and he trying to make eye contact with me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, walking. I get out. I'm walking down the steps. And he's still trying to talk to me. I said, hold on for a second. We get down the street. I go under my stomach and I pull both guns out. Yeah, two, not one. <laughs> yeah. And what hey, happened? You didn't nigga alive, <laughs> <y'all>. <laughs> When they lit me up, I slid both the guns under my stomach. And when dude was patting me down, he never lift my stomach. If I would have <laughs> went to incredible. the county jail, they strip search you. Uh, so I had to make bail before, before that county yeah, bus came. Damn. Now, this is what I was going to tell you early on. I get home. I'm exhausted from dealing with the far side while I'm in the Bay Area, flying back, you know, doing what I have to do at home. They come and bring my gun. It's days of me being tired. I f- drive up, pick up the guns, come back. Now I'm exhausted. I go to sleep. Probably three, four in the morning, go to sleep. Next morning, I hear a knock on my bedroom door. And I'm like, mom, she's like, somebody's on the phone for you. I'm like, who is it? She says, he said his name is Rick Cummins from Power 106. The next day. That morning is when I got that fucking phone call from Power. Changed your life. Changed my life. That's crazy. Yeah. That's Ain't dope. that crazy? Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's, that's deep. <laughs> yeah, that's so deep. maybe they would have called back, mm-hmm. but that day, I would have definitely missed that call mm-hmm. because you I was going to go do that time. That boy mm-hmm. got bailed out before he caught that chain. Boy. Yeah, mm-hmm. man. He caught that chain. Oh, it man. Bad. I would have. And let me tell bad. you the coach shit stack. I caught a, well, I had a situation where I could, I got caught with, with a firearm, mm-hmm. you know? And sure enough, when that motherfucker took me, my man, he said, lift your stomach up. I was like, ah. <laughs> he, he was here. He was here. I was like, ah, he know, but they he found my bullshit. shit. I was, I, they caught me slipping. I had it in my yeah, car at that funny. time. Yeah, but yeah, I would have missed that call. I wouldn't yeah. even be sitting here with y'all now. For real. You know? That's one of the best stories we've heard on yeah. the show. Acting. You, you've had some cameos. Longest Yard, Charlie's Angels 2, Project X, Entourage, Three Strike, to name a few. Mm-hmm. Um, any memorable experiences or you got a chance to work with a lot of great actors in those yeah. projects as well? Anyone that jumps out? I think when I did like um, Deuce Bigelow with uh, with Adam Sandler, yeah. that was one of those things, man, where uh, Adam taught me a lot because I love the way he treated his crew. You know, like I, I think when people say you set a tone, he set such a tone where he was cool. so. Everybody else was got no choice. Yeah. It started at the top. Yeah, man. And he got me to, you know, well, what do you get paid per movie? I wasn't making nothing, you know. I was doing, you know, playing myself and that kind of shit. So he gave me a flat standard, and that standard is what got me into SAG for a certain amount. And every time somebody came, it was like, oh, well, this is what, mm-hmm. what big gets. So that was a special one to me. That Dope. was a special one. And, and he really took care of me, bro, with because it was an Adam Sandler production with Rob Schneider as Deuce Bigelow. Mm-hmm. So that whole camp, but that whole thing was just amazing, man. So who's big outside of work? Man, I'm a dad. First of all. I'm a dad and a husband outside of work. You you, you see us, Matt, mm-hmm. man. You see me and the family, bro. You know, my brothers and sisters I take care of. I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, I think I'm quiet at the crib. You know, people ask my wife like, oh, you must be laughing all the time. You know, if I can get a moment, of course we're gonna laugh at the crib. But I like the quiet sometimes. Mm-hmm. Even mm-hmm. when you're in public, you're not really, you, yeah. you like to dip off. And I'm in telling the you, bro, I love the love. I don't mm-hmm. run from that love. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like people feed you for free. And people mm-hmm. wasn't giving you shit when you needed it. <laughs> right, you right. know? So yeah, like yeah. George Lopez said, man, motherfucker be like, I'll hook you up. and be a burger with nine meats. <laughs> yeah, who needs that? But I'll right. take it. But no, I'm just uh, nine meats. Away, from, away from, you know, the, the public. I just, if I can get home, man, and just sit, mm-hmm. you know, we don't get a lot of those moments, so man, I cherish them, back. man. And Hell I watch, yeah. and I, I, I'm watching my kids grow. <sighs> Fatherhood, beautiful young daughter, a uh, son who's excelling in high school basketball. What's mm-hmm. that like? The boy, the fr- the twins just got to high school finally. They freshmen. Yeah, man. It's I was crazy. just thinking about the other day. Remember when we saw each other in the Bahamas, and the yeah. kids were like five, maybe yeah, six man. years yeah, old. Yeah, singing Iggy Azalea. Yeah, remember that shit. Um, yeah. No, nah, it, it, it's it's magical, man, because you know you have friends and family members and you'll see each other and you'll see, you know, you'll see like, okay, we got some gray, we got this, we got that, you know, but with your kids, I remember my kids sleeping on my chest, 
Now Jaden's taller than me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It was times when he'd go upstairs and he'd come downstairs and it looked like he just got taller. Like I see your boys, man. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what a, what a time yeah, go. Exactly. Mustaches and girlfriends. And yeah, shit. man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wild hair. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just <laughs> you know, I'm having these conversations with Jaden. You know, he's Same. 16 now. Yeah. I don't want to put too much out there because all yeah. his homies, you know, but <laughs> like, yeah. man, slow, you know. Man, I'm doing the same thing enjoy with the twins. It. Same yeah, thing man. with the twins. But it, it, it's it. good to be able to have that line of communication yeah. with your son, too. Because yeah. sometimes and you know, there's no line. Our kids, you know, they're yeah. handsome. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And they're popular. You know, I wasn't handsome growing up, so it was, it was different for me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, no, you don't? Oh, you yeah. don't? Okay. <laughs> you don't think so? Oh, okay. Okay, okay cool. <laughs> right. All right. Now, uh, quick hitters. First thing to come to mind, let us know. Most awkward interview you've ever done? Uh, uh, Bone Thugs and Harmony. <laughs> yeah. Um, how long you guys been in the business? Forever? How old are you guys? Old enough? This interview's over. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> and we, man, Bone now, to this day, those are my guys. That was their first, like, interview. I was new. They were new. And we oh. just, you know, we turned the mics off and we talked about it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, it was it was a very young big boy <laughs> and a very young Bone Thugs and Harmony. And everybody was raw. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and been, I remember, dude, I didn't know how to let it go. And I remember at one point, Busy had this bottle. He had like a 40 ounce. And he, look, he was looking like this. And he had this look like, man, if you don't shut the fuck up, like, man, I'm gonna take this bottle and bust you in your face with it. Cause we, it, it wasn't like we were standing up about to scrap or anything. It was just one of the things where it was like, it's the interview's over. Yeah, what it is. What we doing for? Funniest interview. Funniest interview. Man, I've had so many, bro. George Lopez makes me cry. Uh, Corey Holcomb makes me cry and he makes me nervous. Hey, yeah, I was gonna say, Corey, get yeah. out of pocket yeah. too. Yeah, oh my God, man. Corey, get out of you pocket. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and, and he don't care. <laughs> he said, he and care. he makes me nervous. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah love, you know, funniest yeah. interview, sad the entertainer. Like, I've had Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle, all he got to do is say, hello. And I'm right. like, ah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but yeah, the man, you know, we we have a good time in the neighborhood and we laugh a lot. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have a, we've had a lot of guests that came through and made made those moments That's even dope. funnier. Who was your radio goat? Radio goat was um there's a couple of them, man. I respect Tom Joyner. Mm -hmm. Not knowing what Tom Joyner was doing a lot until I got in. Frankie Crocker. Um, but my Goat was it's do you know Russ Parr? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Russ Parr, bro. Good morning show. Russ Parr mm -hmm. when he used to do Bobby Jimmy on the original 1580K day F A M. That dude, man, was he he was like he was like me. I didn't know that I was gonna be a radio guy. And if like Ludacris would tell me to this day, he say, Man, you remind me of Russ Parr. Mm, you know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. you just didn't know what was gonna come out this dude's mouth. It was never <laughs> rude or nothing but it was just like you knew you were gonna laugh with that dude that's always a good mm -hmm. thing childhood crush like star or just mm -hmm. star man oh i had a few of them bro like when i got to 13 and started yeah touching myself uh <laughs> sorry about that love sorry <laughs> god damn i forgot she was over there ah. what's the little mama's name over there christina she hey christina did like yeah <laughs> <laughs> She was like, did I touch his hand when he came here? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, um, I would say, man, uh, growing up, you know, Janet Jackson early on. Mm -hmm. Man, and it's crazy because do you remember a group called Sister Sledge? Yeah. Yeah, what the fuck? Like, man, you look at them. Uh, but yeah, Sister Sledge. And uh, <laughs> and I'm dating myself now. Jane Kennedy. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a kid kid. Right. You know what I mean? So this this is like my, my childhood, bro. Mm -hmm. Where I would look at had him in women your spank like bank, huh? <laughs> nah, you stop that. <laughs> this dude. <laughs> this dude. You crazy, man. One album you can listen to on repeat. Mm. No skips. Whew, I got a few of them. Yeah, my I would say um, Bizarre Ride to the Far Side. And the reason why is because not only was that great music, it just take me to a place that I got so many connections and so many memories to that. Mm -hmm. I know the show live. I know, I know the guys. I know them going to interviews. You know, I know from us being in a van to being on a on a plane. Like, there's a lot of investment into that. You know, and then if I just want to 
listen to anything like Darius Rucker from Hootie and the Blowfish, mm-hmm. from Darius Rucker, the, you know, country artist now. Mm-hmm. But Darius is just one of those I could just put on it. But anybody that roll with me, I got different moods. Mm-hmm. I listen to all kind of shit. Yeah. Like, I, I've literally pulled up the valet and people are like, you listening to this? You know, mm-hmm. I, I think I swim in the hip hop pool so much so, yeah. that sometimes you just want to get out and just ring, yep. ring yeah. out. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That's how Snoop is. Snoop don't ever listen to hip hop. Hell yeah. You yeah. go, yeah, you go to mm-hmm. dog, you know, dog is this Old Teddy school. Pendergrass, yeah. all kind Old of shit. School. So five dinner guests, dead or alive. My mom, sitting with moms, definitely. Uh, Martin Luther King. I think I take the five hundred thousand, so it won't be Jay Z. You know, they say the whole five hundred thousand <laughs> or Jay Z. So my mom, Martin Luther King, uh, shit, Oprah. I haven't met Oprah yet. Interesting. You so I right? sit. I'll sit with Oprah. Um, my brother Keith. So I could just you know tell him how instrumental he passed on. I could tell him how instrumental he he was in you know steering his baby brother into this music thing. Mm. And um, shit, last last seat. Hmm, mm-hmm. that's a hard one because I got a few that I could get that last seat to. Man, probably Cicely Tyson. Ooh, nice. Have I heard that one before? Nice. Yeah, I like that. Jack, I'm excited about this last question because Big is a good dude and his Rolodex is fucking insane. Yes, and I'm going to slow this question down. I'm going to actually DJ screw it. <laughs> if you could see one guest <laughs> on this show, who would it be? But. But you have to help us get your answer on the show. On the show. Make sure we clear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I would have to help you get them. Yes, shoot, yeah, shoot I, them you slow it down. Slow it down. Say it again. Who would you like to see on our show? Mm-hmm. Help us but go. we have to help us get your answer on the show. Man, I would say, but I would have to help you. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm, damn. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's a key word. I say <laughs> because between us, there is no six degree. I think it's a one degree of separation because we know everybody. Right. Um. Are you familiar with a dude by the name of his his real name is Jose Alonso, but they call him the Brown Horny? Mm-mm. Oh my God, dude. Like this motherfucker is the Brown Horny. Yeah, that's him right there. That's Jose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can get I can get Jose in this seat of <laughs> I can get him in this seat of 30 seconds. Jose, would you do all the smoke? <laughs> Yeah, he said he'd hey. think about it. When you said when you said when when he said Jose, I'm like, hold up, I Jose's over there. Yeah. He ain't talking about that. No nah, man, you know what though? Has anybody said Dr. Dre? No. Ooh. Have y'all had Dr. Dre on? You asshole. Yeah, man. man. You got it. 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 Hey man, he I know it. He was thinking me. like, but I, I said like the brown hornet. <laughs> <laughs> I know the green one. Is it brown horn? Is he black? Is it black superhero? Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. Hey, but you just but, said, uh, Dr. Dre. Said. Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre. She. But you know what, though, man? I think that Dre would trust being here. Yes. Because that's anybody that see how y'all get down, man, right. like. We giving flowers. Come on, mm-hmm. man. Like, I, I could definitely see Dre C. Yeah. We'll be honored, man. Go ahead and yeah. send him too. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Go, ahead, go ahead and send that text, Big. Yeah. yeah. Well, well Bishop going to be like, hold on, because we got to get our Dre in first. <laughs> Sorry about that, Bishop. <laughs> Sorry about that, Bishop. Hey, uh, but before we get out of here, man, we really just want to give you your flowers, man, okay. what you mean to the radio space, but also the West Coast and L.A. alone, man. You, you've been brother. a trusted voice for a long time, man, and, you know, a personal friend of mine. Yes, you know, our kids grew up together, so. Just want to say how much we love and appreciate you, Thank man. You, and keep fighting a good fight, bro. Appreciate it, man. No doubt. Hey, man, real shit. I was expecting like a, a gift. I was looking. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. We I was like, treat. is it chaining day? I was like, man. <laughs> <laughs> we got some treat. You need yeah. some treat. Get back. We got, yeah. yeah, right. All right. We got plenty right. of treat. Load them up on all the stuff. Well, send it here. to my Gettysburg address. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gettysburg address. All right. Hey, yeah. man, that's a wrap. Big boy. Man, I love y'all, man. All the smoke. Me too, bro. We'll see y'all next week. Thank you. All the smoke productions.